There's been a significant decrease of younger people in churches in the past couple of decades. And the studies show that churches are getting older and they're getting grayer. For the most part, younger generations seem to be rather indifferent toward God. At best, people might want to be spiritual, but don't want commitment to a particular faith. A major study in the past decade called the National Study of Youth and Religion revealed that uh, at least teenagers today see religion as a nice thing, but don't necessarily have any real uh, enthusiasm for it. Teenagers quickly become 20-somethings, and we're seeing less of, the, less of them in churches as well. Today's sermon is for all of us, for parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, even if you've never been a parent. Everyone in this church, because it takes a church to raise our children, Right after Moses tells Israel to hear, to shema, we're learning that word, aren't we? To hear that they are to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their, all their soul, with all their strength. He says this, he says, and impress these words on your children and talk about them when you are at home. Impress these words on your children and talk about them when you are at home. The teaching and, and nurturing of children, the next generation in the Lord, is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. Several times in Deuteronomy, Moses brings this up to tell the people to teach their children. See if you note a pattern in these verses. They're all from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4. Teach the commands to your children and to their children after them. Remember when you stood before the Lord at Horeb, when he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. Deuteronomy 11, teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk, walk around along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Deuteronomy 31, the children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 32, Moses said to them, take to heart all the words I've solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. Again and again in Deuteronomy, we hear Moses tell the people to pass the stories, pass along the commandments of the Lord to each new generation so that those generations can know, so that they can love, so that they can serve the Lord. Children aren't just to be taught just, just moral principles, but what it means to belong to God and live for God. And the nurture of children fills the Bible. It comes up again and again. Abraham was to direct his children to keep the way of the Lord by doing what was right, by doing what was just. Part of the Jewish Passover meal involves a children, ask, children asking questions so that they can learn the story of God's deliverance of Israel. Proverbs speaks of the wisdom of training a child in the way he or she should go. We heard Psalm 78 this morning. We read that because it proclaims that we will not hide these things from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. And in that passage it says, even the children yet unborn, those yet to be born, the transmission of the faith is so potent that, that it will be certain that those who are yet to come can count on hearing the teaching of the Lord. The goal of teaching, the goal of telling the story to the next generation, that they will put their trust in the Lord. Paul wrote in his letters to fathers to bring up your children in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And Jesus' parents knew the responsibility of teaching their own son. After Jesus was born, Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord as it was required by Jewish law in Exodus. 
The law said every firstborn must be presented to the Lord. And then Jesus' parents brought him to Jerusalem every year for the Jewish Passover. It was their custom. It was where the worship and the stories and the environment of faith could become a part of Jesus' upbringing. And twice we're told, Luke tells us, Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and strength, and in the grace and favor of both God and people. Don't we want those same words to be true of our children? How do our children grow in that wisdom, that stature, that favor, that nurture of the Lord and others? Shema means, we're learning, it means to hear. And we are to hear for our children. We are to hear who the Lord is. We are to hear that we are to love him. We are to hear how we are to love him. And we are to impress this upon and teach our children. Not just pass along information or religion or morals. The Shema tells us to learn to love the Lord our God. Because to God, the most important thing in life is not becoming a soccer champion. It's not becoming a successful business person or going to the best college or someone who travels the world. It is to love God. I'm afraid sometimes we think the faith formation of our children doesn't happen until they're older. You know, once she begins to talk, or once he gets to preschool, once he starts to read. Folks, the spiritual formation of our children begins way before that. It begins from birth. Psalm 22 says, from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Psalm 71, from birth I've relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. And you know, just as a child learns to trust the parent from birth, really even from the womb, learns to trust that mother, can he or she not begin to trust their heavenly father? You know, in Jewish families, the Shema is the first thing that is often read at the birth of a child so that those are the words, the first words the child ever hears when he or she enters this world. Nowhere in the Bible do we hear, well, just leave your child's faith to chance. God doesn't give the option of, of letting our child just explore what's ever out there or choose what is right for them as if, you know, relationship with this, the Lord is like choosing laundry detergent. He is the Lord. He is jealous for us and his love for us. God is the biggest reality of life. Do we really think it doesn't matter if we embrace love, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, the redemption, the salvation, and life beyond death? We don't leave our children's physical health to chance. We wouldn't think of not taking them to a doctor or withholding medication or just letting them eat anything they want. We don't leave their mental or emotional development to chance. We don't say, well, I'll let them decide if they want to go to school or not. Uh, we find the best possible schools. We hire tutors. We schedule them into activities so that they can develop. We make sure they can kick a soccer ball and play the piano and speak two or three languages. Should we care any less for their faith? Now I know Sometimes we do that, and then our children get older and they resist. I didn't like going to church when I was younger. And when I got to college, I thought I was done with it. Until God showed me he had other plans for my life. And some of us are doing, some of us have done, and we'll continue to do our best to nurture our children in the Lord, but then we've seen them walk away from it. Nancy and I have three grown daughters. They are all in different places, let's say, in relationship to the Lord. And I pray for them regularly, and we'll always do that. Or we're grandparents, and it grieves us that our grandkids aren't being taught to know the Lord. 
Sometimes the path to Christ, though, doesn't come by a straight line or an unbroken line. We see that with people and families in the Bible. Doesn't mean we should give up or lose hope. Some of us know our relationship to the Lord wasn't exactly a straight line. It took time. It took certain experiences. It took uh, God working things out, sometimes in crises. But we keep praying. We keep setting an example in our lives of what it means to live by faith in Jesus. You know, we're a small church, and, uh, but there are children here. And uh, uh, most of them are relatively new to this place, and I'd say in the last year or two, and we're trying to grow in our responsibility to nurture them. But even if we had the hottest Sunday school and best youth group in town, the church does not have the primary responsibility for a children's relationship with the Lord. Nor are those things enough. Parents in the home are the first line of influence in Christian faith. The first line of influence. It starts in the home. It says, impress these words on your children. Talk about them at home. A church partners with the home, but that's the first place of influence. Do you know Sunday school didn't even come into existence until the late 1800s? For centuries, that was where we learned faith, in our homes. And for us to teach our children, we have to know the faith. We have to know the story. And we can't introduce our children to a God that we don't know ourselves. And the best way for our children to make Jesus Christ a part of their lives is for parents to make Jesus a part of theirs. Don't figure out ways to make them what to get them to walk with the Lord. You walk with the Lord. You get into the Lord. They learn from us. Uh, do we want our kids, do we want our grandparents to pray? Do they know we pray? Do they see us praying? Uh, do we want them to value worship? Then they should be able to see that we value worship. If we want them to know the scriptures, then we should model reading and learning the scriptures. If we want them to give, if we want them to serve, take seriously their relationship with God, we need to. First, we need to settle it in our hearts that the Lord is our God. We nurture and practice what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus ourselves. And then we pass that along to our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids. And I am always encouraged when I see our parents and, and grandparents teaching our children about the Lord and, and bringing them to church and how they can make faith a part of their family. But while the primary influence of Jesus is in the home, we also need to affirm the role of the church community. It takes a, it takes a church to raise a child. It takes a church to raise a child. The influence of the church in my life when I was a snot-nosed, rebellious punk still rings out in my life. I could tell you stories. It takes a church to support parents, too. You know, when we baptize a child, uh, our entire church comes around that family, and we vow to pray and to nurture that child in faith. We don't leave those parents uh, or parent alone. No, we come around them, and we say that we will be with them in this. That's part of the Presbyterian tradition of the Christian faith, is that we believe we are all together in a community. We need each other. We teach each other. We worship with each other. And walking in faith is something we do in covenant with each other. Maybe you're a senior and your kids are gone, they're grown. Seniors, grandparents, will you th do this? Will you take our children seriously then that are here? Know them. Talk to them. Find out their names. They're part of your church family. Be spiritual parents. Be spiritual grandparents. Know our parents. Remember what it was like when you were at that stage of life? Maybe I'll even raise the stakes. Maybe, maybe you should uh, have a family over in your home for dinner. Build relationships. Reach out. We all, play, we all play an essential role in our young coming to know and love God. I heard someone say this. Passing faith on to students takes models, not theories. It takes mentoring, not programming. 
I'll challenge you who do not have children or youth at home or here. Practice your faith and your love for God by, by teaching our youth. Help us live out that command to impress it upon our children so that that faith doesn't die out, but another generation can know Jesus Christ. Here's, you know, here's what I think would be a great Sunday school time. Show up, read a Bible story, talk about it, and then play a game and just talk and hang out. I think that'd be enough. I think lives often are influenced more by that than the slickest curriculum. You know, I don't remember what my Sunday school teachers, everything they taught me, I don't remember anything about the curriculums we used. I remember that they cared and that they talked to me. Part of teaching our children is allowing and encouraging them to ask questions. Our faith carries into those conversations in our homes. And I think it's exciting when our children bring home those questions, those things they're thinking about, which sometimes take us by surprise, don't us? Doesn't it? What they're thinking about. Or they bring home something they heard at church or, or even at school. And, and those things become more complex and they become more serious the older they get. But we need to keep those conversations happening even as those questions get steeper and they get harder. And when they ask those hard questions, even questions we may not have an answer for, join your child in wrestling with that. Where did God come from? Why do bad things happen if God is good? My friends are being baptized. Should I be baptized? What's baptism? What's the meaning of communion? What's the difference between Christianity and other faiths? What should I say when I pray to God? Will God still love me and forgive me when I do bad things, when I make mistakes? Can I trust him when I'm afraid? Because I'm afraid. Working through those questions together is, is part of that growing of the faith in them and in us. Now, sometimes we might be a little timid to teach our children because we feel we weren't exactly shining examples of following of Christ or we didn't do it at all and we feel guilty. I think they call that imposter syndrome these days, right? We may feel, well, it's hypocritical to lead our children to live one way when we certainly didn't. Well, in Psalm 78, part of the basis of teaching our children, it says, is so that the next generation will not make the mistakes of the previous generation that was stubborn and rebellious. And maybe we need to learn to admit and talk about our mistakes with our children so that they can know God's grace and that they can learn what we did not. Parenting is terrifically challenging. And I think today it might be as hard as it's ever been. It takes great love. It takes patience. It takes trust. It takes endurance. It takes intentionality. It takes a church. It takes the Spirit of God. There's a lot of joys. There's a lot of heartache in parenting. I've, I've experienced it. But isn't that true in every aspect of raising our children? Those of us who remember what it was like when our kids were at home, we can testify to that, can't we? And our relationship with the Lord gets deepened as we impress the Lord upon our children. Don't divorce what you do as a parent from your own walk with Jesus. Our children are a gift in our lives. They're a gift in our church. And there's no greater gift that we can give them than to teach them and show them the God who created them, the God who loves them, the God who will be faithful to them our, their whole life long. And forming our children is a huge responsibility, but, but we have a huge God. And he is to be known. And he's to be loved. And we're to tell our children about his love. Let's pray.
almighty God from whom we receive our life, you have blessed us with the joy and the care of children. As we bring them up, give us calm strength and patient wisdom that we may teach them to love you. Oh Lord, our children are growing up in an uncertain and confusing world. We ask for your spirit to lead us, to show them that nothing can separate them from your love. Make us all examples of people of the Lord Jesus Christ that are young, may see him in us and what we say and what we do, how we act. In his name we pray. Amen.